My name, uh, everyone, is Tim Anderson. I'm the Head of Global Development um, at the International Cricket Council. It's wonderful that you've all decided um, to come along today and share in what I think is going to be a pretty important day in the history of cricket in this country. I want to talk, or talk to you very quickly about our advisory group um, and I'll also introduce those people quite shortly. Um, I underlined advisory group. Um, there's been some comments out there in the media about a board or um, that these guys, the guys are going to take US cricket forward. That's not necessarily true. They are an advisory group that has been appointed by the ICC um, under the conditions set down by the ICC board in line with USAKA's suspension. That's important. These guys are advisors to us. Um, they have a broad range of skills. They come from a broad range of areas. Um, and they are going to assist us with this strategy development process. That's their main role, is to help with the strategy development process. They come from various parts um, of the US cricket community and also various parts of the US sports community. Um, so together with all of you, um, we're going to have a terrific day today, I think. Um, I just want to quickly run through the agenda before I pass back to Mike to introduce David. Um, he will talk a little bit about the ICC, as I said, and a little bit about the, the process and the current circumstances with USAKA's suspension. Um, Dan, Ben, and all of you, we're going to do a lot of group work around this strategy um, process. Uh, a big part of that is going to be uh, a case study on MLS. Mike talked about soccer. Dan's done a lot of work with soccer and MLS. We're going to have a case study on that. Ben's going to talk to you a little about the current state of cricket in the USA from a data perspective in terms of participants and how that compares with other associate members and also some full members, just to give you a bit of an understanding of where US cricket sits at the moment. Um, and then most importantly, and I thank you, most of you, um, that have been able to uh, fulfil the, the survey that we um, put out a couple of weeks ago, there's some really interesting information that's come out of that survey and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in order to try and break down what are our priorities here. Um, there's lots of things that we can do on our strategy but which way are we going to go? That's going to be the start of that process and we're going to get you in groups and talking about that and then reporting back to us as well. So that's going to be quite an exciting session. Um, we'll have some lunch and we'll have a networking opportunity. It'll be a long lunch. We'll have lots of chances to catch up with people, um, which will be good. Um, after lunch, we'll have a panel discussion. Um, so myself and Dave, um, Usman and, and Jim and Dan will be involved in that. And then you'll have a, an open Q&A session as, as well after that at the very end. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, on my personal behalf, uh, welcome to everybody. In particular, thanks to those who've volunteered their time and uh, energy to be part of the advisory group. In particular, I know a lot of you are involved in cricket in some form or other, but in particular, Jim, uh, welcome to that group and thank you for your time. We have a very simple strategic plan. Last, in fact, it was last round of meetings in the June uh, annual conference, the ICC approved a new strategic plan for the period 2015 to 2020. And it's a very simple plan. It has four key pillars to it. Cricket is at the top of that list, and it's not by coincidence that I always put cricket at the top. Um, equally important are integrity, major events, and game and market development, but cricket, I feel, should always deserve to be at the top. That's what we're all about. And when we talk about cricket, what are we going to do there? Well, we want to have three formats, viable formats of the same game, not something that's easy to achieve. The test format might be cannibalized by the T20 format. These are risks we are aware of, but ideally we're saying each of those formats has a place in the sun and we want to keep them going for at least as long as I'm going. And that's all about trying to inspire and attract people to play and watch the game and to entertain them. Maintaining the integrity of the sport is paramount. In the previous um, strategic plan, we had nothing specific. We had an anti-corruption unit, but nothing specific about the integrity. In this strategic plan, we've promoted that activity of the ICC to one of the four key pillars. So in that respect, we're talking mainly about preventing corruption in the sense of match fixing, spot fixing. We all know that it's been, uh, unfortunately, part of cricket. It's a part of many sports. But in cricket, it's probably hit the headlines to a greater or to an extent that we wouldn't uh, be very proud of. But it's something that we work hard on, and in fact, our anti-corruption unit is now uh, one of the leading organizations as far as sporting organizations are concerned. 
a lot of the sports look to uh, cricket as to what it does to make sure that international cricket is corruption free. So this is what our strategy looks like. Now, I can't even read it and it's right in front of you. <laughs> I don't expect you to. But at the top, it says their vision. Fairness, integrity, excellence, accountability. Sorry, not, this is the values. Fairness, integrity, excellence, accountability, teamwork, and respect for diversity. The next, the line just above that is the one I was re really trying to refer to. The world's favorite sport. Now, how can you hope to achieve that? if you don't prioritize development. And on the extreme right-hand side of that page is that key pillar I talk about, game and market development. Now, as I said, Tim Anderson, Matthew Kennedy before him did a great job. Ten years ago, ICC, I think we had about 45 members, approximately. Ten full members and about 35 or so associate and affiliate members. Ten years later, we've got 105 members. 95 associate and affiliate members. Number of participants back in 2005 or so, outside of the full member countries, outside of India and England and Australia, in all the other countries, 275,000. Now, 1.4 million. In the last eight year cycle, ICC invested $245 million in associate and affiliate member cricket. In the current cycle, we plan, should we get our revenue projections or achieve our revenue projections of about, if we get to about 2.5 billion, which is not impossible, in fact, uh, reasonably achievable, then at that level, we will spend an increased amount, $300 million on associate member cricket. I think the biggest change though in the strategy as far as this five or the next five years compared to the previous five years is that it's going to become even more targeted. So in the last five years, you took out 245 million, you financed all the services that were provided, the events that were run for development uh, for associate countries, and you gave out money to all the associate members. And it was according to a scorecard. And that scorecard highlighted the importance of performing both on and off the field. But going forward, we're going to make that uh, accountability for performance even higher. What we want to achieve is more competitive teams at the highest level. For how many years now we've had about arguably seven or eight teams who could win a major event, an ICC World Cup or an ICC World 20, T20. Bangladesh and Zimbabwe rank outsiders. Beyond that, we managed to get Ireland, Afghanistan, Holland on occasions, Scotland every now and then, a couple of countries up to the level, but they were up to the level of, at best, let's face it, Zimbabwe or Bangladesh. They couldn't con uh, consistently anyway challenge the higher full members. So the focus in the next five years is to make sure that more teams are capable of winning a World Cup or a World T20. We want the, uh, the USA as a team, to be at the World T20 in 2020, playing in the event, and we want them playing in the Cricket World Cup in 2023. So before we go into discussing as to how that can be achieved, I just need to clarify a few things. As Tim said, this is not really about the suspension of USA Cricket Association, um, but I think a few points need to be clarified. As I've said, the ICC is a members organization with the members deriving benefit from its collective strength, which means that the ICC is accountable to its members and vice versa. So some of the members benefits include funding, competition opportunities, as we've spoken about, all those events, access to participation in those events, services, education, our anti-corruption unit, uh, development programs, etc., etc. On the other side of the coin, though, if you're going to get the benefit of these um, benefits, there are some obligations. Those obligations are set out in our constitution and are in our membership criteria, both for full members, but probably more strictly, I suppose, or stringently for associate and affiliate members, mm -hmm. and in the ICC funding policy, which is applicable to the associate and affiliate members, that scorecard I'm talking about. 
which is constantly in, in the process of being revised. So essentially, you get these benefits, but to some, in summary, I suppose it's fair to say all that we really require you to do is to act or to be and act like a responsible governing body. As simple as that. So like any organization, ICC has got its rules, and if the rules aren't met, then there are consequences. An important finding of that report was the disconnect uh, that exists in cricket in, in the US. And this today is part of starting to change that. We want to help change that. Today is a critical step in that regard, as is the development of a shared strategy for the game's future in the United States. You all over the place, you've got strong leagues happening. There's more cricket that, that exists that we even knew about. So um, that's a huge advantage, and, and I suppose all we're saying to you is don't give up on that. We still want those leagues. We still want you to be, to be uh, doing what you're doing when it, when it comes to running leagues, running academies, running youth programs. That, that shouldn't, uh, hopefully, it shouldn't just come to a standstill all of a sudden. It's all good work, and hopefully we can harness that in the future towards a collective goal. Um, and it's just, it's great to be in a room today, guys, with such um, excitement and passion and positivity. Um, I think I've had the pleasure of meeting you all now. Um, between Wade Edwards and myself, I think we've harassed a lot of you guys over the last few months trying to get information about your leagues and data and names of people and all those sort of things. So a big thank you for you guys um, contributing towards that. Some of the information you provided us, you'll actually see on these uh, stats here today. But as Tim mentioned, much of today is about the future. But I think to give the future some context, we need to understand where we are right today. So David's spoken about some of the governance issues and some of those sort of things. I think one of the key reasons we're in the room is the cricket. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what's going on on the field, basically, on an, and, and in some elements off the field. And here we go. So as I mentioned, so we're going to go through some historical data so we can sort of see where the cricket has come from from a, nu a numerical point of view. We're going to compare the USA to some of the top associates. So David spoke about the Intercontinental Cup and the World Cricket League Championships. So some of the teams that are really competing well but are still at associate level. And we've got a couple of interesting statistics um, that we've been able to get from some full members and how the USA compares in those uh, areas as well. So senior players, this is um, a, just a statistical count over the last, what's that, 12 years. Just to quickly explain at the end, you can see in 2012 there was a, a bit of a peak to a degree. In 2013 the numbers went backwards. Just to explain that, because it appears a little bit in the data, that's when a few of the USACA leagues um, jumped out um, of the USACA organisation. So what we report on here is members of national governing bodies. But what we wanted to do to get a true representation of what's happening in US cricket is we wanted to get everybody into these statistics. So again, that's why we've been speaking to you guys so much over the last few months. So that peak's not necessarily new cricket that's popped up in the last year, but it's actually accounting for ACF leagues and the, and the numerous leagues that we've actually discovered on, in some respects that aren't aligned to ACF or US, USA, CC or USACA, all these, all these various bodies. So these, this data's pretty accurate. Don't take it as gospel, but it's, it paints a pretty clear picture. And the big thing there is you can see there's some really good performing cricket countries like Ireland and David mentioned Netherlands and Scotland that have been in world, world events. There's a lot more cricketers here in the USA than there are in any of those countries. So that's a real strength of what's happening here at the moment. So for those that haven't met me, my name's Ben Kavanagh. I uh, run the America's Regional Development uh, Office. So Dave spoke, spoke about um, the ICC. At non-member full member level, there's five regions. One of those regions is the Americas, uh, where our office is currently based in Toronto. So Tom, um, Tim introduced Wade and Tom as well. We work with 16 member countries to deliver what Dave mentioned about events, funding, and services. And to paint a picture, I suppose, of the context that we, with which the USA fits within our region, you can see there that 65% of the players across the 16 countries in the Americas all come from the USA. Canada is another big player. And of the other 14 members, only make up 9%. So you're a huge part of our focus in our office as well. This is quite an interesting statistic. So we haven't been able to get all the stats from a, a number of the full members. But again, we talk about the serious number of senior cricketers that are, in, that are in the USA. You can see compared to a couple of test playing nations, um, Zimbabwe, there's a lot more cricketers here than, than there are in Zimbabwe. And in New Zealand, that just recently uh, were a finalist in the World Cup. 
There's almost as many senior men's cricketers here as there are in New Zealand. Now, we haven't got, just to, to keep things in context a little bit, I don't want you to think that win a couple of tournaments and you can go and see David and get test status straight away. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think if I was to put India or Australia or England statistics in there, they might go up to the sixth floor. So there's still a lot of, um, a lot of improvement that can be achieved here, make no mistake. So let's go back in time. 20 years ago, Major League Soccer, soccer in this country, um, it, it was a very much a sport similar to the feeling that was in this room, right? You had a small group of extremely passionate people. You had this great um, world code, um, you know, that hadn't reached uh, North America or America at the same level of passion. Um, but emotionally, you knew there was something there, right? But what could you do to develop a long-term strategy that really got buy-in? So 1994, um, the World Cup was hosted here. And part of that, um, and I think this is a very important point, um, this was really done with the governance and the structure that was established by FIFA uh, to really create a long-term play in this country, very similar to some of the comments that, that you saw David give this morning, of what is the sport going to look like in 20, 30, 40, 50 years in this country versus the next six months, the next 12 months. And that was the time and place where they asked those questions, right? So, you know, U.S. Soccer Federation was on the verge of bankruptcy at that point and actually probably should have filed. And because they were thinking small and they'd never really looked at the big picture, um, they had that feeling for it. So fast forward to today. This is incomprehensible to believe 20 years ago, and U.S. soccer is based here in Chicago, so I even shared with them that I was coming here. And they would have told you that 20 years ago, if you would have said that a World Cup match played by the U.S. soccer team would outdraw TV ratings of the NBA Finals, the Major League Baseball World Series, and the National Hockey League Stanley Cup Championship game, you would have thought they were crazy, right? And think about that in terms of potential for this room. So it's 2014, you know, and, and think about 2044, which would be the 200, 200th year anniversary of the first international match that was played on U.S. soil. Think about for a moment of where USA cricket can go from a comparable level. Um, I think the goal of showing the soccer example, one is something to aspire to, right? And two, um, it's a path worth studying, but we need to translate that in the same way, I would say, when, when I went to Australia for the first time or started working with T20 leagues around the world, we needed to translate a strategy. We didn't just need to, to dump it in there. What I would challenge, that one slide where it shows you, you, could, you could go after millenniums and youth, w w fill in that blank of what Hispanics you know, would be, right? And factually tell that as an example of a target but have a short, medium, long strategy where everybody's on the same page, where we have buy-in, right, um, you know, to be able to do it. Look at the census, right? Look at the populations. We've studied where cricket in the United States is, you know, from viewership, right? Digital makes it a lot easier to do it. I think the other equalizer is the ability to internalize that content, um, you know, because of digital platforms, too. So uh, longer discussion, but I think that is a, that is a blueprint um, is I think everybody can agree rationally is a great example of what we could become, but those are the right kind of questions to be asking. We want to think big, right? We all kind of feel that way, but the reality is we need to focus small. We need to figure out our strategy, then we can lead to that just like Major League Soccer did. What's that narrative for cricket in the USA? What are we? What is the story we want to tell both to the public, the media, and the next generation? Youth participation is the key, right? What are the benchmarks? How do we all become accountable? Um, you know, some of those stats that Ben showed, are those good, are those great, are they exceptional, are they adequate? We don't know, right? But let's be bold and let's set the bar high just like soccer did. And, and I think there's a path that we can achieve that. And again, I can't stress enough, fan nurturing, right? Cricket's an intimidating sport to get to know, right? As someone, I didn't know the rules, um, you know, and, and the ability to do it. I needed someone that could nurture my now passion 
that now I'm engaged, right? You got to understand that rationally. People, people want to feel part of something. How do you nurture as well as engage those fans? And then, you know, the commercial marketplace becomes very important, um, you know, as we get to that next level. Major League Soccer, as an example, has restaurants, banks that sponsor youth tournaments now that provide funding for it. So there's almost a double down effect once they've reached kind of that critical mass where the rational nature really starts to tell that story. There is already some cricket in U.S. colleges, but not a lot. Is cricket being part of the NCAA really possible? So if I may, I'd like to give you just a little bit of a, a background on the NCAA because I think it's important in the context of what's possible for the future. Uh, the NCAA, like, like the ICC, is a membership-led organization. So there are 1,100 institutions that participate, 470,000 student athletes. Uh, of the 1,100 institutions, 350 are in Division I, so they've got their own set of requirements. Uh, 300 are in Division II, and 450 are in Division III. But what are the differences? Division I uh, has to offer more sports. Uh, they have to provide more participation opportunities. Division II, slightly fewer, and Division III actually provides no scholarships, no athletic scholarships. So the, the uh, process that the NCA uses to deal with emerging sports is very, very well defined. And you say, well, have there been any? Well, right now, this year is the first year of sand volleyball. Uh, rugby's in the queue uh, to be added as soon as they meet the requirements of the NCA. And those primarily are you have to have uh, 50 or 60 schools that will, will support uh, cricket in this case. You would have to have them commit to funding cricket over a period of, of uh, years. So you can't just say, yeah, we like cricket, we support it. You have to demonstrate that you're in a position to not only offer it, but to, to support it. Now, the question that's now on the table is, uh, is anyone willing to do that? If you look at Division I right now, there are a series of lawsuits that are threatening amateurism as we know it. And if if the NCA were to lose on some of these high profile, it may mean the fact that they're going to have to begin paying their players. And some of the lawsuits actually suggest that, that they should be paid a percentage of the revenue. So there's a lot of uncertainty out in Division I. And as I talk to Division I athletic directors, they're saying, hey, we're not adding any sports until we know what our fiscal situation is going to be. Now, on the other hand, uh, as Tim and Ben know, I was talking to a colleague out on the East Coast uh, that said she had been talking to a president at a university who was interested in cricket and wondered if uh, he could call me. So I, had, I took this call from this president who said, I really want our institution to offer cricket. Uh, help us do that. Help find a way for us to do it. And if you help me, I'll try and help you within our conference to get other schools to offer cricket. Now, this is Division Three, no scholarships, but it's a place to start and a place to, to engage the university community. Right now, cricket is played as a club sport, and that's not even under the athletic department. So there's, there, there's promise out there. Uh, but I would say to you to uh, have cricket be an NCAA sport, all you have to do is go out and get universities that are willing to support it for the long term. So yes. One last point yeah. I'd like to make as well. I think it's extremely important as you think about this as part of the strategic plan, there has to be a single point of contact. If you're dealing with the NCAA and you have three units, in fact, we just had a sport that came with two and the committees ate them up, and they, they, they messed with them. I have to be careful what I say here, but they had a lot of questions. And they brought into question, why are there two organizations? And they tried to force them to work together. They wouldn't, and so they declined. 
to add their sport. So one of the things that I think is an absolute certainty here, if you think you want to be in the collegiate space, you must have one voice. I believe the only way it happens as, uh, as a university sport is it's offered as a women's sport. You can't offer men's without women's, and then I would suggest to you, given the balance and the Title IX requirements, and I could go over those if you wanted to hear, but I won't bore you with it, but suffice it to say, women's has to come first, and without it, you, you won't have cricket. Simple. Mike, can I just clarify one point? I'm not sure that everyone in the room would understand it, but there's been a lot in the media in the U.S. recently about the fact that ICC discontinued the uh, competition opportunity for the American U.S. Uh, women's team. Now, that doesn't... I just want to distinguish between saying, okay, U.S. American, don't come to our international competition. Take that money that you could have spent on that and put it into grassroots women's cricket or girls' cricket. So we still very much support women's cricket in the U.S. It's just that we're not financing the team and to go and play in an international competition. That's no different to a number of countries. Um, uh, they have the same problem. Um, uh, Philippines, for example. I might, if I just sure echo then. that, again, to the question earlier, alignment, right? That's a perfect right. point of, of how great organizations, great sports are aligned together to go back to that vision. Okay. Next question, uh, we'll move on to facilities. Without proper infrastructure, quality cricket cannot be played. Most leagues don't have proper pitches and aren't supported enough in this area. Even if there is funding, it is difficult to obtain necessary permits from respective cities as cricket is not yet a national stroke recognised sport. This area needs to be prioritised. How can the national governing body help? Osman, I think you're the man for this one. Sure. So, totally agree with the question that uh, good facilities are required to develop this game here. However, I'd, based on my experience in Texas, I don't think there is lack of facilities in the U.S. It's the lack of quality facilities. And the onus is on us. How many of the club cricketers are willing or, or they desire to have uh, a cricket pitch, uh, a turf, uh, genuine wicket? How many are willing to take the time to roll a pitch? How many are willing to mow the grass? How many are willing to do everything that's required for a good cricket facility? Most of the people playing cricket in America uh, have, have never played cricket in, in good environments, and their standards are pretty low. I, I'm sorry I'm, this is being provocative and uh, might offend a few folks, but that's the reality. And they're okay with playing on, uh, uh, on poor, fa poor facilities because that's, that's the standard they have. So we have to take the ownership, and, and I, have to, I have to point out to, uh, to Saki here, who kind of believed here in this, and he took the initiative and built a facility that is international quality. We have to take the responsibility. What national governing body can help out with is um, providing the, the guidelines, providing the expertise, how to build a pitch, how to maintain something maybe a little bit of funding, but the responsibility has to be with us. We have to raise our own standards. Um, and, and it dawned on me when I was playing club cricket in the UK where the club captain was coaching on uh, Mondays and playing on Tuesday and uh, mowing the grass on Wednesday. He was doing 40 hours worth of work. Nobody here is willing to do that. So it's our own standards that are very poor. And I really believe in the broken window uh, philosophy where if things are bad, uh, it's a lot easier to get worse. So that Rudy Giuliani that believed in New York, right, if there's a one broken window in a, in a building, the likelihood somebody would throw a stone. And that's exactly what's happening with us. Our facilities are so poor that Americans don't get attracted to it. We don't want to uh, make an effort to fix it. If we had good facilities, uh, the standard would continue to rise. And I think the problem is the cricket community, uh, not the uh, recreational and the government uh, parks. Um, and, and I don't think it's hard to get, at least in Texas where land is abundant, uh, getting, getting a piece of land is not an issue. It's just our standards are pretty low and it's unfortunate. How many, um, how many facilities are there now which an international game could be played on? I can count those on my fingers. Uh, so one or two in Florida, one in Houston, uh, three or four in uh, LA. Uh, 
uh, Indianapolis. Five, so that's about it. And uh, there might be a few artificial pitches that are of decent quality, but l l that's pretty much it. So maybe 15 to 20 decent fields when you have 15,000 people playing cricket. It's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Okay. I think purely uh, I'll put my um, uh, United States hat on. I mean, I think um, you know a lot of us in this room would feel that we're trying to develop heroes and aspirations, right? And the thought of aspiring to be part of an, a U.S. Olympic team is very appealing to a lot of young children, right? When you think about um, you know the the kids that you're trying to recruit, so I really look at it um, you know as a credibility play, um, you know here domestically, um, you know that for a lot of athletes that is the pinnacle moment, right? To be an Olympian. Um, you know, to aspire to that. And I agree with, with David's point, um, you know, on the some of the other international competitions and, and what that means from a traditional cricket-rich country. But purely just speaking from a United States standpoint, um, you know, those those rings, um, you know, gold seal of approval for, uh, for a lot of Americans to be able to do. Um, I also think the alignment, um, you know, in the, the USA governing bodies, um, you know, that are really based out of Colorado Springs here domestically, uh, do a really terrific job of developing talent um, as well and, and kind of aiding in that structure and that longer term vision of, of really kind of picking out talent, um, you know, and, and being able to develop, you know, those young boys and girls that could be future Olympians too. Uh, and I think that's something important to think about. Going back to soccer, rugby, some of the, um, you know, in, in, in this marketplace, more of non-traditional or emerging sports, as, as Jim said, you know, what you've got to understand is um, corporations, you know, corporate partners um, are in the business of their business, right? So one of the things that's very important is alignment of a community of people that they can invest in versus support a cause. And right now, you know, looking at it again rationally, um, the passion, the emotion for this sport is a cause that we all feel, right? We're emotionally tied to it, something we're very passionate about. Um, but from a business standpoint, and I'd use women's soccer, you know, as a great uh, metaphor, women's sports, the WNBA, um, you know, they need to evolve and, and have evolved from a cause of women's sports uh, into a sustainable audience in the community of people that advertisers, sponsors, et cetera, can, can support. Um, that can drive business back to them. So what part of this, right, it's an alignment of a community of people uh, that is growing. Once that community is scaled and recognized, and that's one of the things that was really appealing to me from a digital perspective, it's able to um, aggregate a community of people. That's something advertisers, sponsors would get behind because you all have tremendous purchasing power, right? When you start to align all of that together, that's what gets the attention. And my strategy going to that short, medium, long, um, you know, if, if you look at a brand parallel, cricket probably is what I would classify in this country as a challenger brand, right? It's, it's got great potential to challenge the guys that are up on the Mount Rushmore of sport, if you will, um, here in this country. I would attack and try to secure revenues from other challenger brands. Um, you know, of commercial products that want to support and grow with you, and you look at some of those other sports, what they were able to do, it's the same process, but you've got to be real and you've got to sell that vision. It can't be just short term or cover costs. Frankly, that's your problem, right? Um, but their problem is how do we sell our product or service? So going back to that slide, stand for something, tell a story, and create an economic opportunity for them is the longer term play. And that's where you can get a lot of those sustainable revenues, but you've got to hit the reset button in a conversation like this and develop that strategy. Brands will invest in that versus just ask for what it, what probably right now is just a donation. I think we are 100% committed. Uh, the fact that we are already investing in this project, the fact that we are already getting experts to join us uh, to make to achieve what we're trying to achieve the fact that we've made the effort I think we've come out to the United States three or four times Tim has spent more uh, time out in this part of the world trying to speak to everybody in the report uh, Process or the evidence ga gathering process. We spoke to over a hundred stakeholders 
Um, and I think, as I've said already earlier in the in, in today, uh, for the first time, our board is fully behind it, knows exactly what's happening in the U.S. And uh, I suppose I don't want to be uh, a CEO <laughs> in a couple of years' time, and people will look back. Oh well, he was just. He was the third CEO who failed in the US. We're fully committed and I'm hoping that we'll achieve what we want to achieve, as I said, together with you all.